start by extending my gratitude to Indology Foundation and especially to Mishra for inviting me to present this talk and for giving me this platform and opportunity to talk about a prehistoric Chalcolithic community, which is very close to my heart, uh, especially that uh, focusing on Southeast Rajasthan, that is the Mimar region. Before I uh, directly jump to my topic, let me start sharing my slide. I'm also particularly happy to do this, especially today, which is Teacher's Day. But I don't see myself as a teacher. I see myself as a student. Because the day I started teaching, I started realizing that I've actually started to learn. So I am a uh, student still now, and I will be a student all my life. And whatever I have been able to learn uh, about this culture, uh, which was also part of my PhD topic, I will try and share with you. So let me start sharing my... Okay, so uh, before jumping into the topic, as you can see, uh, this is the first slide and this is actually uh, the slide of my university that is second college. So let me just say two, three lines about my institute to which I belong because it has a very long and rich legacy and history. It is the third oldest institute in India. It was established on 6th of October, 1821 initially named as Hindu College. And let me take this opportunity to also say that next month, that is coming month, October, 6th of October, 2020, we will be celebrating 200 stellar years of our service towards teaching, towards research, and towards thought leadership. Um, this institute has produced a number of students who rose to position of excellence in various walks of life. Just to name a few, Sir Ram Gopal Bhandarkar, the celebrated Indologist, then Lokmanya Bal Gangadhar Tilak, the great nationalist leader, uh, then Ramchandra Dattatre Ranar, philosopher, Gopal Ganesh Agarkar, the great social uh, reformer, uh, Vishwanath Kashinath, the famous historian, and Dr. Uh, Dwarkanath Potnes, the famous Indian medical practitioner who rendered human service to China. The present department that I belong to, Department of AI, HC, and Archaeology, uh, is, uh, well, was uh, led Professor H.T. Uh, Sankalia. And in the last six decades, this institute has uh, not only excelled in providing quality master's program and uh, producing large number of PhD dissertations, but also invested in path-breaking researches in uh, AI, HC, and Archaeology, in anthropology, biology, sociology, linguistic, and Sanskrit. With that, let me come to my today's talk. And before again directly jumping to Aharbana, uh, because Mishraji told me that there will be there will be a lot of uh, people who are outside, uh, who are not from the uh, you know subject of history and archaeology, and may need some basic background of you know what is the time period we are talking about, what is the region we are talking about so that it becomes easier later on to understand the facts that I will be sharing with you. You see, as a prehistorian, uh, of course, prehistory, let me just start prehistory. Prehistory means the time period where there is no written records. So as a prehistorian, I'm interested to understand those time period, the history of humanity belongs to this time period where we do not have any written records. So what do we do? In that case, archaeology becomes our tool, our methodology to understand what the life was like. If I want to know what the life was like 10,000 years ago or 15,000 years, 10,000 years ago, then obviously archaeology is the only tool in our hand to do so. And I feel that the most remarkable transition in the, the history of humanity is the almost simultaneous appearance of domestic plants and animals in several different parts of the world, uh, ranging from, say, somewhere from 9,000 years to 1,200 years ago. Now, this transition to agriculture uh, way of life involved much more than simple herding or, uh, you know, just cultivation. It entailed a major, long, uh, long-standing, I would say, uh, change, long-term changes uh, in the structure and organization of society. And most importantly, 
human beings, we were developing a new relationship with the environment. Why a new relationship with the environment? Because as agriculturalists, as farming societies, we started to modify our landscape. We started to cut down trees. We started to burn the forest in order to make lands for agriculture. We started, to, we started an artificial augmentation of food. So we as human beings are developing a new relationship with the environment and the landscape around us. You see, hunting gathering life was much easier. Easier in the sense many people were uh, they lived off, largely you know, off the land and uh, uh, usually exploited diverse and uh, resources over a broad span of area. But as farmers, as agriculturalists, we intensively utilized a smaller portion of land, creating a milieu that suited to our needs. So Shunta Ito, who was a very famous uh, Japanese archaeologist in 1969, had identified, you know, five different regions where origin of agriculture took place independently. Now, we all know that the first theory for the origin of agriculture was put forward by Gordon Child in his uh, book, Man Makes Himself, which he published in 1925. We talked about Neolithic revolution and he mentioned a place in West Asia, you know, in the Palestine and Mesopotamian region, the area along the river Tigris and Euphrates with Taurus and Zagros Mountain on both the sides as the area where first domestication or agriculture happened and then it spread all over the world. But now we know, based on our researches in the last five decades, that it is, it is we do not believe in the single, single origin theory anymore. We know that agriculture developed uh, in different parts of the world almost simultaneously and independently. And it's not like it really happened in West Asia and then spread all over the world. So uh, Shuntaro Ito has identified five regions um, where agriculture took place independently and uh, West Asia, of course, the Palestine and Mesopotamia, Central Asia, the coastal regions, then Southern China, the Yangtze Valley, then Mesoamerica, that is the Mexico, West Africa, the Niger River. Now, in addition to these five regions of uh, domestication, uh, now it has been identified three more areas, especially in South Asia, where agriculture developed independently post Pleistocene, that is post Ice Age. And these three areas which has, which has emerged so far, one is the wheat and barley uh, in the western, northwestern and western India. Then second is, of course, the rice area, the rice cultivation area of the Gangetic region. And then third is the millet and other crops in the Mewar region of Rajasthan, which we will be focusing today. Uh, apart from these three, uh, two more sites, two more regions have been hypothesized very recently in the last five years or seven years, I would say. One is, of course, South India, East and Northeast India. Now, uh, so we are actually, this is the indigenous area. We, are, we will be concentrating on this area today where we believe that uh, uh, agriculture has developed independently with the Harappans or West Asian influence. So before jumping into Aharbana's culture, let me just give you an idea of the age now, when we talk about a region or when we discuss a regional perspective, let us understand that we are not thinking of India with the present political boundary. So India, 1,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago, the political boundary was very different. So we use the word Indian subcontinent where parts of Baluchistan was with us, Afghanistan was with us, Pakistan was with us. So we are talking about a much broader area with similar kind of ecology and similar kind of cultural heritage and continuity. Uh, so the picture that I'm showing you here is the Indian subcontinent uh, belonging to the Neolithic and the Chalcolithic. So Neolithic, again, uh, is, you know, the whole human history has been divided into different phases. So it starts from Paleolithic, which is the Old Stone Age. Paleo, Old and Lithic comes from the word Lithos, which means stone, followed by Mesolithic. These are again hunter-gatherer population, but now they are producing very small micro uh, uh, lithic tools that is uh, equated then we have the Neolithic, where we see this sharp transition in subsistence pattern. People are no more following hunting gathering as their mainstay of economy, but now they have become agriculturalists, they are farmers. Then following Neolithic, we have Chalcolithic, where farming is continuing. In addition to that, we have copper. Chalco is copper, so we have metal. Then, of course, post-Chalcolithic, early historic, historic, medieval, and this is how it goes on. So here I'm showing you Indian subcontinent ranging from, say, 7000 BC to I would say 3000 BC. Uh, so this is the, this is the uh, uh, region, uh, Indian subcontinent, of course, 
why so many cultures, you know, uh, early farming communities developed here because it had a very favorable ecological condition. It provided a very suitable context for the rise of early farming communities. And uh, it witnessed two independent streams of village economies. One, of course, in the West and the Northwest, which is the, uh, uh, which is the uh, uh, West Asia. That's the area in the Baloch, uh, Balochistan part where we uh, uh, Mahergar, sites like Mahergar, Kilegul, Mohammed, and then in the Mewar region, where almost 4,500 BC, we are seeing this, we are getting evidences of this transition from hunting gathering to agriculture. So the earlier beginnings goes back to 7,000 BC, as I have mentioned, in the northeast region of uh, Afghanistan, Balochistan, and then the later, the independent development of the Harbanas. Um, so here, what you see, the yellow part that you see here is Balochistan at the adjoining region. Then uh, we have the Neolithic and Chalcolithic uh, uh, of uh, North India. Then, uh, of course, the, this is the Harappan culture. This is the Padri. This is the Anartha tradition. This is the Ahar Banas on which we would be focusing today. Uh, Ganeshwar Jodhpura, as has been mentioned by Vinayji, these are, this is the Ganeshwar Jodhpura is actually a different cultural complex from Ahar. They were, of course, simultaneous. They were parallel, contemporary cultures, but they are two different cultural entities. So Rajasthan actually had two cultural uh, Chalcolithic cultures. One is Ahar Banas and the other is Ganeshwar Jodhpura. Then um, this one is the Kayatha uh, Malwa, where again, we have seen some continuity of the Ahar in the Malwa region. And then uh, this is the, uh, mainly the Savalda Jorve, the Chalcolithic trends of Maharashtra. This is the South Indian uh, Neolithic. This is the OCP Copper Horde. This is the, again, uh, Neolithic Chalcolithic cultures of North India. And this is the Eastern Northeast. Um, now coming to Ahar culture. So Ahar is the early farming communities of Mewar or Southeast region. That is the earliest people who started agriculture, the first people who started agriculture in this particular region. Uh, the Ahar cultural sites uh, are mainly located in the valleys of rivers, Banas, Birach, Otari, Gambiri, Khari, and their tributaries. So far, total 106 sites of Ahar culture has been discovered. And the first Ahar site was discovered and in, uh, in the, sorry, in the, in the district of Udaipur was excavated by Professor A. In 1961 and 62, based on which he gave the name of Ahar Culture Site. Uh, there's a report published, a very detailed report published in 1969. Then uh, VN Mishra and VS Shinde of Deccan College, uh, they excavated the site of Balatha during 1992 and 98, which has contributed immensely on the understanding of Ahar Banas culture. Uh, then Gilund, uh, which is the largest Ahar site standing at 25 hectares. Uh, was excavated by uh, Professor V. Shinde, and it was a collaborative work between Deccan College and University of Pennsylvania, that is the late Professor G. L. Pushel. Uh, this was initially the site known as Bhagwanpura was initially excavated by uh, B. B. Lal in 59-60 also. Then the site of Ojiana, uh, which was excavated by B. R. Mani and Alok Tripathi, and then finally Marmi and Purani Marmi, which was again excavated by R. K. Mohanty of Deccan College in 2001. Now, Ojiana and Marmi have been uh, 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 subjected to very small scale excavation. We do not, we, we, we couldn't have very open air horizontal excavations, but uh, the major, major information about, uh, you know, the, the, the cultural composition has come actually from Ahar Balakal and Gilun of the Ahar culture. Um, this again, just to show you, you know, how along the rivers all these 106 Ahar sites are located and this is the Ganeshwar Jodhpura complex. This is the Ahar complex. This is the site of Bagor, which is best, which is mostly known as a Mesolithic site, but has given very recently, has given very important clues about this transition from hunting gathering to agriculture. We will get into that. Um, now the important thing is that why do we need to know this culture? Now before this culture light and especially the C14 dates from Balathal, Balathal which was excavated by Professor Vian Mishra, I hope, I think, is still now the uh, site with the highest number of C14 dates ever excavated in India. We have more than 40 uh, C14 dates coming from this site. And especially after the dates came, the whole concept of understanding the origin of farming societies and the origin of Chalcolithic culture changed in Indian perspective, in, this, in, in, in Indian archaeology. So before the culture came into light, uh, it was believed that this origin of farming society and establishment of, you know, early farming villages 
came as an influence from West Asia or mostly from the Indus Valley, from the Harappans. It is from the Harappans that we have learned how to farm. It is from the Harappans that we have learned all the basic technologies. This was the main uh, understanding because the dates of the Chalcolithic uh, cultures were mostly a little late, whereas in this valley, pre-Harappan dates were going to 3200 BC and the Chalcolithic cultures were all in their second millennium or late uh, or first millennium, early first millennium BC dates. Uh, but once that 3,700 date came up from the site of Balakal, and not only one date, many such consistent date from the earlier phase of Balakal came, uh, which actually precedes early Harappa because it starts from 3,200, it was proved that the origin of farming societies is definitely an indigenous development and an independent development in this region and has not happened because of an influence from the West. And especially the site, Bagor, as I mentioned briefly, is a Mesolithic site where we have found within the Mesolithic, we have found two phases. Early uh, one is ceramic Mesolithic and aceramic Mesolithic. The aceramic Mesolithic is the previous phase, which has given us 6 millennium BC dates. And the ceramic uh, uh, Mesolithic phase has given us dates of 4,500 BC, so 5th millennium BC dates. Now, why is this important? Because again, see, pottery, you know, generally, in a very general uh, way, is always associated with farming societies and neolithic communities. Why? Because when do you need pottery? You need pottery when you need to store things for storage facilities or say for cooking facilities. So obviously, it's not that hunter-gatherers do not need pottery. We have enough evidences of pottery being associated with hunter-gatherers. But it became more important and it became, um, it was used more profusely by the farming people. So once pottery was found in the Mesolithic phase, it was very interesting that the hunter-gatherer people we're starting to produce these potteries, these incised potteries, ill-fired, handmade incised potteries. And what we also got is evidences of a shift towards plant cutting. So there was a reduction in paleofaunal, archaeofaunal like bones, and there was an increase in archaeobotanical remains from the site of Bagor, which clearly showed a shift towards plant cutting or towards, you know, some sort of incision farming. So beyond any doubt, now we have very clear clues that yes, agriculture or farming in this part, especially in the Mewar, was an independent and an indigenous development. Secondly, the important part of this culture is that if you really compare Ahar Banas culture with other indigenous Chalcolithic cultures of India, then that I, this, this, I would say, is the only culture which has reached to a certain proto-urban level. We see some sort of incidents of urbanization. Like we, we, we get to see some site planning, we get to see monumental public architecture, we get to see, you know, streets and lanes and we get to see very advanced uh, 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 copper technology, we get to see, you know, trade relations, like they had trade contacts with the Harappans and even people from uh, Central Asia and West Asia even going back as far as Iran. So uh, this is the only, again, uh, Chalcolithic culture, culture which gives us that proto-urban level. Of course, it could not develop to in this valley, the way we see the urbanization in this valley, but definitely it played a very important role. Being a primarily a Chalcolithic culture, it did play a very important role. Uh, so this is the reason why we really need to look into these indigenous Chalcolithic cultures more and more. And of course, Ahar Banas is giving us, is, is becoming the, the most potential, I would say, among all Chalcolithic cultures to talk about these things. Now let me start with some wonderful pictures. So this is an aerial view. I am very thankful to my institute at Deccan College Archive, who have provided me all these images that I would be using. These are images uh, belonging to Balatal, belonging to Gillen Project, and they have been given uh, to me by my institute's archive, Deccan College Archive, so I'm extremely thankful to them. So this is an aerial view of the site of Balatal, uh, while the excavation was on. As you can see, you know, trenches are being laid and everything. And uh, I think I have seen uh, uh, here uh, 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 Jeevan sir, Jeevan Karakwal sir, very briefly. So I think he's still with us and he was also part of this. He was being Mishra sir's students. He's an alumni of Deccan College too. And um, he's, he's my teacher also, like he's, he's like my teacher. I have been trained in a site in Kamir under him for a brief period of time when I was pursuing my PhD in Deccan College. So he was part of this, uh, uh, this uh, project, this excavation, and I'm sure this will make him a little nostalgic. Uh, so this is the aerial view of the site of uh, Balathal uh, while the excavation was on. This uh, this particular site is located in Vallabhnagar Tehsil of Udaipur district. The site is on the eastern margin of the present village of Balathal. And this is the ancient mound, the site of Gilung. So Gilung initially, you know, when uh, in the 50s when the site was discovered, it, everybody thought it was a Harappan site because there was two mounds, one bigger and one smaller. 
So it kind of gave that image of typical Harappan site, like, you know, a citadel area and a war town area. But when the excavation, uh, post-excavation, people realized that it is an indigenous Chalcolithic site. And this is the largest, uh, so far the largest uh, Ahar Chalcolithic site uh, standing at 25 hectares that has been excavated. Uh, so it is located in the Rajasthan districts of Rajasthan and there are two mounds. Now, what we will do is we will we got in terms of theology, in terms of economy, in terms of architecture, social organization, these are ideological perspective, this portion of their chronology, and then we will finally decline. We will discuss on you know how the culture disintegrated and declined and uh, how to contextualize this culture outside Rajasthan, or is there a scope to do it at all? So uh, coming to technology, the first thing that I would mention is because it's a Chalcolithic culture, so we have to talk in detail about the uh, copper technology. Now, Aravalli, uh, as an independent center of metallurgy, is very well established, and we know uh, that it has been a very important area of copper manufacturing uh, uh, in, in pre from prehistoric time. And in this regard, now let me mention very briefly Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture, though it is not my topic today, that uh, Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture um, illustrates an indigenous, it is the, that is, this is also Ganeshwar Jodhpura cultural context is also an indigenous uh, Chalcolithic culture. And uh, it sustained a larger regional uh, economic need uh, for copper. This Ganeshwar Jodhpura is actually the largest uh, copper producing community, copper artifacts producing community in South Asia, which was catering copper artifacts to uh, in this valley people and to all surrounding you know, Chalcolithic cultures. Uh, but unfortunately, very uh, less is known about the cultural composition of this culture. Uh, mainly, I think, because of limited excavations and uh, very scanty published material. So regarding the cultural composition part of Ganeshwar Jodhpura, we really don't know much, but we know this much that uh, this was probably a huge community. This is this was the largest coppersmiths community in South Asia, belonging to 4th and 3rd millennium BC, who was producing copper artifacts and catering to all over South Asia. Now, it is believed that this uh, Chalcolithic communities, they were exploiting this copper sources and producing this, uh, uh, this, this copper artifacts in very large quantity and exporting to the early mature Harappans and to other indigenous contemporary societies. So that's, having said that, I don't mean that the Ahar culture did not produce. I mean, we have no evidences of copper technology or copper manufacturing technology in Ahar. We do have. But uh, of course, when you have such a nearby culture, which is producing so much of copper artifacts, some of these artifacts may have come from the Ganeshwar Jodhpura region to Ahar. Uh, so what you see here is some sample artifacts from our cultural sites, you know, different kinds of choppers, knives, razors, chisels, arrowheads from Balathal. And uh, uh, Balathal and Ahar are the two sites which have yielded uh, li like uh, copper artifacts in profuse quantity. Gilund, on the other hand, has not yielded that much of copper artifacts. Uh, very interestingly, but uh, we have a lot of copper artifacts from Balathal and from um, uh, Ahar. And some metallurgical investigation has also happened on these artifacts. You can see some of these, you know, holes where samples has been taken. So one reason, uh, some work has been done, um, you know, in collaboration to IIT Kanpur on a copper, chalcolithic copper nail from Balathal. And it revealed um, that the process of coal deformation uh, after initial casting was used by the Aharians. And the corrosion rate of the chal chalcolithic copper was only marginally less than, you know, the copper. Uh, uh, the modern copper that we use today, which actually implies that the um, uh, the technology was really advanced. Copper technology, going back to fourth millennium BC, was really really advanced. Uh, several small, roughly made uh, have also been found in Ahar, and uh, the copper tool of Balathal, as you can see here, knives, razors, chisels, arrowheads from Balathal. Uh, regarding the subsistence and economy, so how do we reconstruct the subsistence and economy of any? Uh, any uh, culture that we are doing, of faunal material, archaeofaunal material, that is all kinds of animal bones that is there. We recover a lot of uh, archaeobotanical samples, like soils are collected, huge, huge amount of soil samples are collected, and then they are brought into the lab, they are floated, and then this, species, this, this uh, uh, specimens are collected, and then we look, in, look at the uh, microscope and we try to identify the species, and this is how the process goes on. So same has been done uh, for all the sites and uh, 
uh, based on all the archaeobotanical and archaeofaunal remains, what we can see is that, of course, agriculture was the mainstay of economy of our culture. And uh, with that, a little bit of animal husbandry was also practiced. Some indication of hunting practices are also there because we have got the small, small sling balls, stone sling balls, which implies probably presence of a little bit of hunting. So food economy, of course, we have cultivated and wild species both. Then bones of domesticated and wild animals, including birds and aquatic creatures, have found copper lights of goat and sheep. And then a lot of food processing equipments and food storage facilities have also been found from all these sites. So among the uh, uh, plant remains, so wheat, barley, of course, then different kinds of millet, because Mewar is known for this indigenous development of millet. Then green gram, black gram, common pea, uh, trianthema, which is this flowering plant, and of course, Indian jujube and safflower. These are the kind of uh, archaeobotanical remains that has been found from all the sites. Uh, so these, these grains were definitely uh, grown and consumed by these people. Then uh, in faunal remains, animal remains again has been studied uh, by Thomas and Joe Baker, by David Tetsu, by Matthew J. Land, Land from the sites of Ahar, then Balakal, then you know, from uh, Ojiana. Ojiana, a lot of archaeobotanical remains have actually come from the site of Ojiana. So among the domestic animals, uh, we have this humped cattle, then buffalo, then sheep, uh, then a goat, pig, and dog has been found. And among the uh, wild animals, we have elephant, we have gore, we have milgai, we have uh, black buck, four-horned antelope, cheetah, sambar, uh, uh, wild boar, we have mongoose, rats, fish, turtle, and of course, mollusks. different kinds of uh, shell, bivalves are also there. Uh, now, throughout all the sites, uh, looking at the relatively high number of this boss species we have, that is the... Uh, uh, cattle and the, and the buffalo species we have and the disposal pattern that we see throughout these sites, there is no doubt that um, they were all part of the uh, consumption, that they were all part of the food economy. Uh, now, uh, coming to a very important aspect, architecture of the sites. Architecture, why this has become very important because as I mentioned that this is uh, the only Chalcolithic culture, uh, indigenous Chalcolithic culture of India, which reached to a proto urban level. And the best evidences actually has come from the architectural aspects of the site. Uh, uh, so last year, in fact, in 2019, me and one of my students, Aishwarya Maske, we, did, we, did a, we actually published a paper also. We did a research on the settlement archaeology of Ahar culture, and we specifically focused on two sites, mostly Balathal and Yemen, simply because uh, this sites were excavated very extensively and intensively and opened up horizontally. So we have a lot of structural evidences coming out. It has exposed a lot of structure. So it was easy for us to, uh, you know, use the data and use the information. So we have focused on these two sites. And uh, what we tried to do uh, in this particular research is, first of all, we tried to understand the functions of the structure that has been exposed. Uh, then we tried uh, understand the site organization, then we try to understand the management and defense mechanisms. And then finally, we try to understand all the architecture in the context of landscape, which is very important. Because the cultural uh, features, when we when we identify such culture, what, what is culture? How do we build up culture? Whatever is available around, whatever is available locally, whatever use that we get influenced by that. And from that only we make our culture, right? Different aspects of our culture. So it is very important to understand this kind of development in the context of the adjacent landscape. So that also we tried. So in this slide, the slide that I'm showing you, what you see is the site plan of the Balathal. You see, this is the site plan of the site of Balathal that was excavated by Vian Mishra. And if you see just in the center of the site, this is the center of the site, you see this huge, huge fortified uh, enclosure uh, with very thick wall. If you see, these are the very thick walls here. Some of the pictures, um, very thick wall, and this is pretty big. Uh, this is almost this has covered an area of 550 uh, square meter. Um, this is a very impressive structure. At the same time, I would say till date is most the most elusive structure in Malaka. Now, why do I say the most elusive structure? Because Till now, we really don't know for sure what was the function of the structure or what is the function of the structure. Now, what do we find in the structure? We find a lot of layers and layers of burnt cow dung. You see, 
uh, inside the structure, inside this, evidences of, uh, uh, you know, architecture also, like other architectures. You see, outside this, we have a lot of houses, house complexes and room complexes and streets and by lanes. But within the structure, there is hardly any, we have found any structure. So it's very interesting that such a huge monumental fortified structure has been built up just in the center of the site, which obviously says that it was a very important structure. And looking at the monumentality of the structure, we can say definitely this was for some communal purposes. It cannot be for us, for some individual's use, it was for a communal purposes, but for sure, we do not know what was exactly the function, what was going on inside. Uh, inside uh, this particular structure, but it's a very huge structure, very impressive and the most elusive structure. Um, and of course, this has been associated with the mature phase of the uh, site. As far as the um, some more uh, just uh, you know images of structures that has come up from the site of Balatan. Now, as far as public architecture, so basically the architecture in from all the sites of uh, Ahar Banas has been divided into two. One is a public architecture, which are communal, basically communal structures, and then one is the domestic architecture, which are of course the individual belonging to individual people. So first, I will I'm just showing you the public architecture that we have found uh, from the sites. So from Gilund, again we have found two very impressive uh, public architecture. The first that you see here is this. Again, this is quite monumental. This is quite a huge structure, quite impressive. In Gilun, you see this very large structural complex of parallel walls running, uh, you know, uh, uh, north south, almost twenty meter long. And then, of course, uh, you have we have also found the circumference around the site of Gilun. Uh, now, this particular structure, again, has been identified as a warehouse. That is a structure which probably has been... Uh, okay, I will try to slow down. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, this is a structure which probably has been used for a um, storage facility. So that is why it has been identified as a warehouse. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the lack of uh, absence of archaeobotanical remains from inside the structure, we do not know what exactly was stored in it. But definitely, this is again a public architecture and uh, a very important part, huge, basically, storage facility that was present at the site of uh, Gilu. Uh, then, uh, so these are some of the uh, 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 domestic architecture um, uh, from the site of Balathal. Uh, these, the pictures that you see here, is um, uh, basically all from the mature phase, uh, but uh, Vian Mishra has also reported uh, a few structures from the earlier phase of the Balathal, and probably uh, most of them were uh, actually uh, circular huts, small circular huts ranging in diameter, uh, like two meter in diameter, and these were mainly made of mud or wattle and dwarf uh, structures. They, they were very flimsy, and of course, in the latter part of the early phase, what we see is some mud brick and stones getting used to build the structure. So again, within the early phase itself, between the earlier part and the later part of the early phase, we have this gradual development of uh, uh, gradual development of uh, uh, building technology in Balathal. Now, in the from the mature phase of Balathal, ten uh, structures have been uncovered roughly, and as you can see here, they are all rectangular or uh, square in shape. Uh, their foundations were laid on semi-dressed stones. Uh, in many cases, walls and floors uh, have been found the cast of clay, clay and kaudang, uh, clay and kaudang, and then structural complex have been unearthed, uh, starting with three rooms to eleven rooms. So, with three rooms and ranging to eleven rooms. Now, what kind? What does this variation imply? This kind of variations may imply a stratified society. So obviously a structural complex with two or three rooms probably will belong to maybe a poorer section of this society, poorer section of the people. And where you have 10 or 11 uh, uh, room structure probably belonging to richer or the elite class, elite people of the, of the community. So obviously this kind of things uh, uh, talks about this kind of stratified society. Now in structural phase six, which is also the richest of all the structural phase, uh, we have also found roads and streets running, uh, running uh, north, south, and east ways, dividing the structural complexes. So clearly, we have a settlement planning. Now, this kind of things are always expected from Indus Valley sites, you know, where 
uh, the whole architecture or the whole settlement is divided into grid patterns into blocks by lanes and streets. So similar kind of you know settlement planning and architecture we are seeing at the site of Balakar. Uh, then um, oval shaped fire pits uh, have been found noticed in both Balakar in the earlier phases. And in the later phases, in all the sites, this has been replaced by U-shaped tulas. And in some cases, there are three arms, three arms of U-shaped tulas. As you can see here, this arm is broken. This is from the site of Dino. The similar things have been found in Balakal also. So which means there are two contiguous tulas. And in some time in this from the site of Ahar also, it has been reported by Sankaria. Balakal, we have found Dino, we have found. In one one room, we have found this two, two tulas, which may also, you know, imply you know, bigger family, uh, joint family kind of unit. Uh, uh, as you can see, these are uh, from the... Uh, so you can see this is probably a cooking area. So there are the storage facilities made into the ground, kind of silos made into the ground that some firing activity has taken here, probably a chula here and some sort of firing activity has also taken up here. Uh, Coming two structures associated with technology. So uh, both from the site of... Uh, Balathil and Gilun, we have got some very interesting and very impressive structures which can be associated with technology. First, which has been reported from the site of Balathil. The first kiln, that is this here, this one here, uh, has been has come up from the phase six structure. Uh, the first, it, it is a large uh, uh, rectangular uh, kiln belong to, belonging to the structural phase six. Uh, it was enclosed with a mud brick uh, wall on three sides and on one side it had a, a stone wall and it's quite big. Uh, it's almost 5 meter into 4.8 meter running like that. Uh, and the entire deposit of the kiln was composed of heavily burnt um, earth or dark ash, charcoal and of course in situ pottery, uh, broken pieces of pottery which were probably kept inside the kiln for baking. And uh, what we also see that uh, the kiln was uh, 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 continuously repaired, very, very uh, probably maybe regularly repaired because we have this fresh base of clay uh, suggesting that it probably was continued for a long time. So it needed uh, some sort of repairment also. And it was probably used for, uh, uh, and another interesting thing is this quorn that you see, a huge stone quorn, which is uh, on the eastern part of, which is located almost on the eastern edge of the kiln. And uh, um, uh, this uh, was uh, probably used for maybe pounding the clay, or kneading the clay, or could be used for pounding maybe uh, uh, pigments for, to, for the application of sleep. So we have, this is here. The second kiln that you see here has been found from the last structural phase, that is phase eight of the site, and occurred immediately to the north of the first one. Uh, for, and the kiln rested on a stone uh, uh, and mud wall and almost the entire surface of the kiln was covered with very thick red slipped tan wares broken in situ and a few shirts of grey ware. Now this kiln is of very special significance and I'll tell you why. Tan ware again, this ware category is something which was always associated with the Harappans because this ware category uh, is mostly found in the Harappan sites not Gujarat Harappan sites, you go and everywhere you have So before this kiln was excavated, the tan wares that were, that were found in association to uh, the Ahar sites, where people were not sure if they were local produce of, or if they were Harappan imports. So people thought that probably they are Harappan imports, the tan wares, into these sites. But once this kiln was excavated and we found these tan wares right inside the kiln, which proves that these tan wares were not Harappan imports, but locally produced at the site. So this was a very, very, very important uh, um, find, uh, uh, a very important implication of this particular uh, uh, kill. Now, uh, also because uh, another important is that both the kilns you find very close to each other in different, different levels. So it also proves that the potter's res residents were located within the settlement and throughout the time it continued to be in one particular, you know, area of the settlement. So this was also an another implication of these two kilns, finding of these two kilns. 
At the site of Gilu, this right uh, pictures are from the site of Gilu. A number of structures, uh, some complete and some partial, uh, were excavated on the uh, southern end of the long mound of GLD2. There were two mounds, GLD1 and GLD2. So structures were uh, excavated. Now, most of these structures yielded evidences in the form of uh, furnaces, slags, uh, uh, then deposits of burning activities, and uh, probably were associated. The excavators believe that probably these structures were associated with some sort of manufacturing activity. That is why we are getting so much of vitrified clay and we are getting slags and ash and something this which is looks like a, you know some sort of oval shaped kilns. So they have named this area as quote unquote industrial area. However, I would like to uh, I was see the thing is that my understanding of all these cultures uh, have been post excavation in nature because I was not part of the excavations. So my understanding uh, has come from the reports that has been published. I have spoken to all people who were involved in the excavation and from the director himself, like Professor Shinde and Professor Koshel and all that. And I tried to understand. And I personally feel that uh, we should express this. Uh, a lot of people say that, yes, this is uh, an area where probably some sort of copper technology was happening at the site of the and all. But I would say that we should some sort of uh, uh, caution because still now it is largely a speculation whether what kind of uh, industrial area is this or what kind of activity was exactly going on here it is still a matter of speculation primarily because this particular area was excavated towards the last season of the excavation and the later part of the last season so it is hardly i mean it has been just partially opened up so to draw more comprehensive conclusion would need more detailed investigation into this area. So that is uh, my uh, observation of this particular uh, quote unquote industrial area. And let me also mention two things here uh, because it just came to my mind that uh, the long, uh, the structural complex from the Gilum, this one, and this industrial area, this particular two finds are uh, we have found a parallel of this from another site uh, so um, so somehow you know the site planning of this aha cultural sites uh, uh, equates or you know resembles those that were uh, you know exactly similar structural complex you know uh, long parallel world complexes has been uh, has been found at the site of Kisara only in Kisara it is a little larger in size and uh, they were all made of burnt bricks. That is the only difference. But similar kind of features has also come up from Harappan side of Kesara. So it just came to my mind. I just wanted to mention. Uh, another uh, remarkable find from the Ahar cultural sites are seals and seals. Why would I keep on using the word remarkable? Because again, seals and is something which is associated mostly with the Harappan civilization, primarily because uh, Primarily because uh, um, uh, uh, in indigenous Chalcolithic culture, we do not have seals and ceilings. It is already mostly associated with the Harappan Valley, Harappan civilization. And seals and ceilings imply some, some sort of bureaucracy, some sort of administration, some sort of central authority. So uh, generally, we would expect this kind of thing with urbanized uh, culture. We don't expect this kind of thing with very rural, you know, cultures. But again, uh, Ahar Banas is one such culture Ooh. where we have found seals and ceilings from from the site of Balathal as well as from the site of Gilun. Gilun has produced the maximum number, um, but we have found, and these are impressions uh, 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 which were found in context from the site of Gilun. I'm talking about. So first, a very uh, of seal impressions uh, was found in large peat in trench 11 outside the just outside the parallel wall so this from here uh, one was found and um, the second was found a uh, large number of seal impressions was discovered from this small which is inside this small uh, circular peat that you see 
which is again lined with the uh, uh, here you can see the lining it is lined with plastered with clay and clay mortar uh, found uh, were found in in, in these two contexts more than 100 silk impression have been found which is very impressive coming from a regional charcoalic culture now these seal temples uh, appear to have been uh, primarily close uh, storage vessels uh, of the ceilings with carved backs um, most have a double uh, curvature which suggests that they were probably uh, uh, used were, were placed on the shoulders of you know globular vessels or large jars and then a few of these um, ceilings have a flat uh, back also so they probably were used on just boxes maybe wooden boxes or other you know flat topped containers the most uh, important uh, most impressive ceiling uh, in from gilun this however uh, this uh, 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 this this large jar stopper which almost is preserved to it and if you see in general uh, the ceiling uh, impressed with rectilinear or round stamp seals uh, uh, are actually impressed more than once like you know this this kind of rectilinear figures are more than once so one two three four five you know different different so they have been stamped uh, probably these are jar stoppers and then they have been stamped uh, more than once uh, the ceilings were made of clay and uh, that ranges in in texture from very fine to coarse uh, with fairly large inclusions sometimes uh, and contained six basic basic motifs so all the designs that we have found from the ceilings mostly six basic motifs we have found. so there are concentric circles there are flowers there are rectilinear or cross hatch designs and spirals sun bursts like you know sun motifs and probably teardrops or fish uh, and ceilings have also been uh, reported from balathal four i think has been reported from balathal in ahar 19 uh, has been reported in balathal a lot of seal amulets have also been uh, identified uh, by the excavators uh, now while the preliminary after this this you know seals and ceilings were discovered at the site of gilun you know the preliminary discussions of the especially gilun ceilings focused on possible emac origins especially in association to the iconography of the seal impressions from gilun um Uh, this BMAC. What is BMAC? BMAC stands for Bactriana Marfiana Archaeological Complex. In simple terms, it is nothing but a Bronze Age culture of Central Asia uh, dating from 2200 BC to 1700 BC. So, initially, the understanding that the seals and ceilings that we have found from Gilu probably have an influence because the modes are very similar, where look, we're looking very similar to BMAC. They said probably some sort of connection, you know, they, they tried to build up some sort of uh, connection with the BMAC region and some sort of uh, maybe uh, people coming in and going out, you know, this region interacting with Central Asian region. However, there is a problem. A problem because the ceilings that we have found in in association to the parallel vault structure has been dated to mature phase, which is 2500 BC, coinciding with the mature phase of the Harakons. But BMAC is 2200 BC. Okay. So how do we address this three year? So again, a second, again, uh, you know, people started uh, looking at things and analysis was done on the Gilun seals and ceilings. And that shows that probably these seals and ceilings falls within the long-standing uh, glyptic tradition that existed throughout Middle Asia. And, uh, uh, and for most of the parallel motives uh, dated, uh, as for most of these parallel motives have been dated to 3rd millennium BC and beginning of the 2nd millennium BC. So geographically, uh, this kind of parallels comes from very far sites like uh, Mari in Syria, as far as Mari in Syria to Ahar, which is the... Now, I'm not denying that the major region may have a contact with the central region, like... Now, this particular part of South Asia was interacting with Central Asia. I'm not denying because in Ahar culture, Ahar site especially, the seals and ceilings have been found uh, from a little later date, like 2nd millennium BC, uh, 1600 BC, 1500 BC. So during that time, it is absolutely possible 
uh, because see broad distribution of uh, of BMAC artifacts in second millennium BC is a very very well studied phenomenon. Uh, but they are hardly known in third millennium BC, and the Gilun ceilings that we are finding in Gilun belongs to the third millennium BC. So probably we cannot really connect Gilun ceilings to BMAC, uh, but mostly from coming maybe this is an uh, influence of the Iranian counterpart, more of an influence of the Iranian counterpart, because the commonalities of motifs, commonality of motifs, are close to Iran more than uh, Central Asia. Uh, but of course. This whole Middle Asian interaction sphere that I'm talking about is not a very simple thing to understand and not a very simple thing to project also. Uh, of course, these findings are suggesting that, yes, we do have a very complicated, very interesting you know, interaction going on between West Asia, South Asia, Central Asia and all that. But of course, we need more evidences for contacts and influences within this Middle Asian uh, interaction sphere. Uh, then coming to Acha, okay, I forgot about, uh, see, we are talking about these things in now, but let me also mention this particular slide, which I have taken from the AHA report that has been published by Sankalia sir uh, in uh, 1960. Here, from the site of AHA, he has already shown some parallels between West Asia and the Mewa region, and this was back in the 60s. Huh? So here, these are terracotta beads. So these are the AAA belongs to the Ahar, the TR is Troy, and TK stands for Turkmenistan. So based on terracotta beads, he had Sankalia sir 50 years back, 60 years back, had already uh, proved that uh, you know, there was some sort of West Asian interaction or influence uh, that was going on with this particular area. So this is nothing new that we are finding. This was there given us some clue already from the site of Ahar. Now coming to the pottery, uh, again, pottery repertoire of Ahar Binas culture uh, is very rich and uh, can be broadly classified to courseware and fineware. Then within courseware, we have many different kinds, thick red slipped ware, gray ware, uh, black and red ware, polychrome ware, and then among fine wares, we have, it, we have white painted black and red ware, and uh, tan wear, katha wear, buff wear, reserve seat wear, and so so on and so forth. So course wear were probably used for uh, utilitarian purposes, like making storage jars, heavy uh, utensils, and fine wares probably were used for table wares. They were used probably as table wares. So here you see this is a thin red slipped wear, uh, which are very fine, probably table wares, and could have been used by the elites, elite section of the society. Then we have this uh, white painted black and red bear. Now this has been actually identified as cultural marker of Harbanas culture by Professor H.T. Samkalia because uh, in Indian context, Chalcolithic context, of course, Harbanas gives us the earliest date of white painted black and red bear. So that is the reason why uh, Samkalia sir identified. It's very unique. It was very unique and it is not found anywhere. It was found and uh, uh, then we have, this is the tan ware, which were initially thought to be Harappan imports in the site, but now from the kiln that I showed you, proved beyond doubt that these uh, were uh, tan wares, which morphologically surface treatment wise looks very similar to Harappan wares, but actually local products. Uh, then we have some of these buff wares, basins, and these are the different kind of shapes that you have in tan ware. These are very small bowls and basins. And in uh, white painted black and red where you have, again, the small medium size bowls and basins. And this is, again, a polychrome ware. Polychrome uh, ware is uh, when you find uh, leaving the sleep color, like suppose if it's a red pottery, leaving the sleep color, if you find three more pigments which has been used to decorate, then we term it as a polychrome ware. If you have two, then bichrome. If you have three, then we term it as a polychrome ware. So some polychrome wares, which is again, uh, polychrome wares are also very profusely associated with the uh, Harappan sites. We have also reported that from the Ahar culture. Uh, some more thick red slipped wear, and these are some of the graffiti marks that you see, uh, you know, and some of the rims also. Uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, this could be some signature patterns of maybe some different potters who were using because we are looking into a site which uh, into sites which existed for 1,000 years or 1,500 years. And uh, even in one phase, like in one particular cultural phase, there must have been more than one potter 
and maybe each potter may have their own signature pattern. So while making the pot and they are putting maybe their own signature patterns, it could be it's a probability, or it could be simply just a you know decorative. Design. These are actually uh, not pottery, but these are basically skin rubbers. Uh, I mean, uh, if if I find parallel in today the loofah that we use while taking baths, so probably these are skin rubbers which were used. Um, uh, so I uh, actually did a very interesting uh, work uh, while, I, while, while I was pursuing my PhD. I did an ethno-archaeological uh, work in the in the um, uh, uh, the village of Gilud. So in 2010 and 2011, while I was pursuing in 2010, basically when I was pursuing my PhD, I had visited Gilud and Balathal and all this site, and I have stayed in Gilud for several months because. All the pottery and everything was, you know, stored there in that in, in the village itself. So I had to go there to study those potteries. And uh, then uh, one day I was out, out in the market, and then I suddenly, you know, something just caught my attention. I saw this beautiful uh, earthen wares, um, and immediately I could I could identify some having parallels to the Chalcolithic pottery, the prehistoric Chalcolithic pottery, protohistoric Chalcolithic pottery that I was looking into. So it really caught my attention and I thought it could be really a very uh, interesting uh, contribution or a good contribution uh, because these are, we still have some very few traditional potters who are producing this kind of pottery which has some sort of similarity with the charcoalithic pottery that I have. So if I study them, if I study their manufacturing technology, uh, not only manufacturing technology, even the social organization, like you know how they are producing the pots, how they are selling the pots, how they are uh, you know, collecting soils for the pots, how they are collecting pigments from the pots, what kind of transport they are using. So if I really do a very holistic study, that could really uh, help me to throw some light on the ancient manufacturing pottery technology. So that was my uh, thought. And uh, this work became more important when I realized, when I went into the village and I started doing a survey, I realized that there was in Gilund at that time, in 2010, I'm talking about, there were 30 potter's houses. And among those 30 potter's houses who are locally known as Kumhars, only six were continuing this traditional form of pottery. Rest all have changed their uh, livelihood. Because simply this is, I mean, we don't buy that, that much of earthen pots anymore. So this does not give them enough livelihood, you know, to support their family, to support their children. So most of them have left it. And the more uh, uh, disheartening information that I found that among the six potters, the last living generation of potters that I was archiving, I was documenting, none of their children have taken up. So I realized that I am actually facing the last living generation of potters. The youngest that I uh, interviewed was in his late 50s and the, uh, the uh, uh, oldest that I interviewed was in his late 70s. So immediately I thought that, and, and I want to take this opportunity to uh, all the young people who are present here um, already who are studying maybe archaeology or ancient history or aspiring people who wants to study, that, you know, as an archaeologist or as an anthropologist, it, uh, this, this responsibility responds, uh, depends, is on our shoulder that these traditional art forms are dying very fast. And nobody is to blame for that. Of course, globalization... Uh, 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 globalization is one thing. We are looking towards a digital India. Uh, so obviously, we have to move forward. We cannot go back. It's, uh, we have to go with the time. But so we cannot. I don't know whether uh, we can uh, make sure to uh, uh, how to make sure that this continues. But at least whatever is still remaining, we can archive them as much as possible and keep it for the future generation to know about their roots, to know from where we have come and how we have come. So uh, so this work uh, was uh, 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 actually uh, uh, accepted in the very prestigious journal in Antiquity and it has been published in 2011 also. Uh, 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 so I did a um, ethnographic survey. So I went door to door in all the Potter's house. Initially, they were not very welcoming, but later on with repeated attempts, uh, I befriended them and then slowly they opened up and they shared uh, their, their valuable information with them and they shared each and every process of making pottery. Uh, but you know what is what is disheartening that when I started interviewing them, 
when I asked them, ki, okay, how many different kinds of morphology or types do you produce? They would say, yeah, yeah, 70, 75. Then when I asked them that, uh, can you name them? They are hardly able to remember 15 or 16, only the ones that they're producing. So see, they themselves have lost the information, lost the memories over time. So if we do not take an initiative, go and archive this dying traditions, then everything will be lost. So I know in another 20, 25 years, we will not have a single traditional potter in and around Gilund for having this kind of ethno-archaeological work. Uh, but anyway, so this is how I have taken up how they are producing the pottery, you know, how they are molding the clay, uh, they're producing the pottery, drying in a leather hard condition. Leather hard is a very technical term, like when you're drying the pottery, before you put it into the kiln, into the fire, you have to dry it to a level where the moisture is, um, is dried up, but still there should be some flexibility in the pot so that you can you know, beat up uh, to, to, to make it into a, in, in a desired shape. Then how, you know, after it is completely dried, they are giving the sleep application and then how they are painting and uh, they are actually using, you know, donkey tails hair uh, to, to uh, uh, make these paintings. And then the final product before firing. And nowadays they are not using uh, underground kiln. So they open fire in, in common grounds, like all potters come together and they select one day and they open fire in the common grounds. So this, I, I will not go into the details of this work because it is available in, uh, in, in SearchGate. Uh, you will all, you have all my articles, so you can read how step by step I have uh, uh, recorded. But I just wanted to uh, uh, wanted to uh, make sure that you know this kind of archival work is as important as excavating sites and writing reports. Um, so what I did is I tried to you know uh, uh, gather information about the present morphologies, the present types that they are producing, and to see key whether I have parallels in my child politics. So these are. That's the typical globular pot used for liquid storage, probably water. Then this is a tawa kind of thing for making chapati. This is a small uh, globular pot uh, uh, equivalent to the lota. You know, many of us have metal lotas in our hand. We still use it, you know, copper lotas to drink water. And then this is a gray again, a gray or slip, black slipware or a grayware, which is mostly used for making buttermilk. Um, and then these are some ceremonial vessels. This is a lead. This is a dhupania, like a dish on stand, which they call dhupania. This is karva. This is a spouted vessel. This is used by the women during the karvachot. Then this is a miscellaneous vessel called gurga, which I found very interesting. Like they make a handi kind of thing. See? Then they cut it along the line of carination. So the lower part is used as tava. And this part is used as a stand to put bigger vessels over the chulans. Then, of course, piggy bank. Gala and then different kinds of diyas and diyas. And equate and see if I'm finding parallels with my uh, chalcolithic pottery. So yes, this is a typical globular pot and we have so many of such from the Aharvanas culture uh, 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 which are uh, uh, in the thick red slipped category. Uh, uh, we have this handi, handi or mono, a similar has been found from chalcolithic. Uh, then dish on stand, this is from Ahar, and this is from the present day. Uh, this kind of things has been found from Aharian sites. This is the present day. Uh, then when I was coming back in Jodhpur, I got a train, and then suddenly I saw women selling buttermilk in this kind of cups. And immediately I could remember a, a, a morphology that was published by Sankalya in the Ahar report, which has been named as T68. So in this way, you know, uh, uh, we try to, I mean, uh, I, I do not claim that However, we are seeing it today, exactly we can put it, you know, 4,000, 5,000 years back, but at least it gives us some kind of insight to understand um, the functions of, uh, you know, these different kinds of potteries and, and probable uses that these potteries may have been used. And see, even the painting, this is a painting on the buffet. And see the present day painting, nothing has really changed. The tradition is continuing till today. And that is why I, I said that, you know, understanding everything in context of the landscape is important. The present day of this Gilun is actually 1.5 kilometer away from the ancient site. See, the landscape has not really changed. It still has the Banas River. It still has the, mount, uh, the farmlands around. It, they still, every morning, they get up and see the peacock. So obviously, when they're thinking of, you know, when they're trying to develop some aesthetic sense, that is where they're getting the inspiration. And the same way, the Aharians also, you know, develop their inspiration from the nature 
and that is how they have built up their culture. Uh, then other material objects, we have many different kinds of terracotta objects, stone, metal objects, uh, uh, and uh, they are some few, few uh, terracotta objects that we have found on the sites. Um, as far as, um, uh, you know, uh, beads are concerned, I would like to say a little bit, uh, you know, beads uh, also have been a very, very uh, important, uh, uh, important finds from all the Ahar sites. Again, why? Because it has also given us some clues about the trade networks. Like what kind of materials probably the Aharians were getting from outside, what the Ahar people were giving to the outside people. So this, the beads, uh, the raw material that we are finding among the beads, kind of give us some clues on that. So beads have also been a very, very uh, important finds from all the Ahar sites. And uh, uh, in Ahar, a tiny terracotta uh, container with uh, rope decorations around the body uh, was found containing 11 beads. Uh, five were of veins, uh, four of shell, and one uh, each of uh, agate and carnelian. Then from Gilund, uh, large quantity of um, agate and carnelian beads uh, along with bead making debitage were scattered in the uh, in, 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 in level dated to mid third millennium BC. So initially when these Shinda and Jelpu shells are was producing because there was debitages uh, uh, seen, they had also hypothesized that probably maybe there was a bead making area or uh, uh, probably at the site of Gilun people may have produced some beads. Then other important finds are this biconical and this, uh, you know, oblate terracotta beads, which have some incised design patterns. I've already shown you the slide from Ahar. So, you know, this kind of biconical beads having parallels from Troy and Putin and Star. Then uh, at least seven beads from the uh, mature phase of uh, Gilun have incised designs that are identical to those of Ahar. And, uh, mm -hmm. Two beads. Two turquoise uh, beads. Uh, have been associated with the mature chalcolithic phase and probably provide some sort of, you know, uh, some sort of contact with West Asia because again, turquoise is not locally available. We have tapis also, also. Uh, so um, the the fact of Oceana is 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 uh, is also very important from uh, from uh, a lapidary perspective. Uh, the finds includes large uh, number of steatite beads. Uh, as well as beads of shell, beads of bone, uh, fanes, uh, we have carnelian and agate, and um, then uh, 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 quartz beads, uh, Ojiana, uh, uh, these, all these materials, the beads that has been found from the site of Ojiana, are actually locally not that available. So probably again, you know, this kind of, they, they, have, they may have reached to the site of Ojiana via other sites, may have come from the urban sites. But, uh, you know, quartz is very easily available in and around Ujiana, but we do not find, find quartz beads in Ujiana, which is very interesting. Uh, but again, steatite beads outnumber all the other types, micro beads, regular beads, thick and thin disc shaped beads. Um, Fane's beads has been found again. Fane's beads is primarily known to have been produced mostly in Mujudaru and Harappa. And we have Fane's beads reporting from many sites. Uh, so again, this is. Uh, uh, this kind of different varieties of materials that we are finding in the beads and the different shapes also talks about some, some sort of uh, trade contacts. So a wonderful, wonderful work has been done by uh, Professor Alok Kanunko of Tekken College, who, uh, who, who specializes in this lapidary uh, understanding in this bead technology. And he has done a marvelous uh, work on this bead. And if you read this paper, you will get to know, you will understand more and more of these uh, uh, informations. Uh, then at the site of Balatha, uh, it has also been very significant from uh, from from beat finding. So a very interesting discovery was done. Uh, a globular pot found buried uh, uh, in the floor, and inside this pot, six smaller pots were found. And in one uh, uh, smaller pot, uh, this uh, many many steatite beads and job steers were uh, found, which is understandable because these are very common necklace components. So, of course, bead making was a very important industry at most of these chalcolithic sites and a variety of uh, this, uh, uh, this, this uh, semi-precious stones and uh, shells and terracotta may have been manufactured locally. The most popular material is steatite. Aravalli, uh, it is available. Steatite is available in the Aravalli, so obviously understandable. 
uh, and then next to steatite, the next choice was we profoundly found uh, find many terracotta beads. Then uh, carnelian chalcedony again. These probably were imported from Gujarat region. So maybe the raw material was brought in and then the bead was produced, or sometimes it could be that finished products may have also come in. Uh, then um, uh, so a barrel shipped uh, carnelian beads from Balathal and Fiends beads, typically manufactured by Harappans, are also found at the site of Balathal and Gilum. Uh, okay. Then uh, coming to the ideological perspective. Uh, so we have found hundreds of uh, uh, terracotta bull figurines, uh, both stylized and non-stylized. In the first is uh, in stylized and naturalistic pattern. So within naturalistic pattern, uh, we have uh, this humped uh, version and without humped. And then uh, stylistic pass, uh, the stylistic pattern is also very popular. But these have mostly found from the late Chalcolithic phases and also the sites which are associated with late Chalcolithic phases. For example, Kurani Marmut, which has been excavated by R.K. Mohanty of uh, Lincoln College, and then Ojiana, uh, uh, which has been excavated by uh, Pati and Nina. Um, uh, so uh, these are the sites. And also, I have found some when I was doing my PhD uh, from. Um, Gilond also in the later phase, late Chalcolithic phase of Gilond, I have found few uh, terracotta bull figurines uh, uh, from the site. So, mostly profuse quantity made has come from the site of Purani Mali and Ujiana and probably may indicate the presence of bull cult, but obviously developed towards the later phase of the Chalcolithic. Now, Ujiana bulls are, uh, are, are very unique in the sense that they are all painted in white. And uh, this white painted bull figurines are uh, not found in other Ahar culture uh, sites. And uh, then uh, uh, has uh, has uh, produced many, many bull figurines. And uh, based on this profuse quantity of bull figurines that has come from uh, Marni, the site of Marni, Mishra has suggested that it could be, uh, you know, some, uh, this particular site may also contribute to uh, uh, could have been a center of bull cult, and uh, but we need to understand this more and more because outside again in this outside the Ahar cultural domain, if we go to the central India, the Malwa region, then again Kayatha is one site and one culture where we again have got a lot of um, bull figurines, and then we have two Kayatha shirts, like Kayatha kind of pottery coming coming out from the sites of Balatal and Gilons. So again, we need to look into these things in a more deeper level. Uh, then uh, coming to the disposal of dead, uh, so we really do not find uh, any necropolis associated with Ahar cultural sites or you know burial grounds uh, associated with Ahar cultural sites as we find with Harappan sites. Uh, probably because uh, cremation was in vogue, cremation probably was in practice, so we do not find much skeletal remains. However, uh, we have found four skeletons from the site of Balathal and has been dated to Chalcolithic level. Now, these two skeletons are too small to address, you know, a, a, a population which existed from 3700 to 1800 BC. And these skeletons has, the, the strata from which the skeletons have come has been dated by, dated to 2000 BC. This particular paleoanthropological work was done by when Rob along with Vien Mishra, uh, sorry, along with Vina Mushraf Tripathi of Deccan College. Now, interestingly, Balathal, among, among this, one uh, uh, particular male skeleton has given us the earliest evidence of leprosy in India. And this is a very, very important find. So actually, Ahar culture, uh, and especially the particular site of Balathal, has given us the earliest evidences of leprosy in India. So. Uh, the comparative uh, genomic research suggested that leprosy evolved either in East Africa or maybe somewhere in South Asia during the late Pleistocene and uh, then it spread towards Europe and the rest of the world. So the earlier widely accepted date, accepted date of leprosy is found in the ancient texts, Asian texts only, uh, to 600 BC and I'm uh, referring to uh, Sushut Samhita and Kautilya's Arthashastra. That is 600 BC. But now, from Bhav, I mean, scientifically, for sure, we can push back the date of leprosy to 2000 BC because we have a, a specimen here 
This is a middle-aged adult male skeleton, uh, demonstrates a paleopathological condition to that of leprosy. And it's, it, it, with, with thing, it, it, it uh, pushed back the date of leprosy to 4,000 years. And the, the way it has, it, it was not also given, you know, the kind of burial that we expect. It was the way the skeleton was found entered in the ash. It, it was found inside that, you know, uh, within the ash deposits of that huge fortified area at one corner. So it's almost into the ash, you know, it's kind of thrown away into the ash. So it was not even a proper burial, but it was found in a very tight flexed position, this particular burial. This is a uh, this is a very very important find. Uh, however, uh, you know we need to look for additional skeletal and uh, molecular evidences of leprosy in India and Africa to confirm you know the origin, African origin or South Asian origin. Of course, we need more than this. Now I am almost towards the end of uh, my talk. Um, so chronology wise, again as I mentioned that Balathal, uh, we, we are we are very fortunate. That our culture has given us. A Lots and lots of C14 dates, and and my sincere thanks to late Professor V M Mishra, uh, because it is him, it is because of his uh, 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 you know initiative we have the maximum number of C14 dates coming from a chalcolithic site of Balatal and the most C14 dated site I would say uh, in India. Uh, so the earliest that has come from Balatal goes back to 3700 BC, and as I mentioned, that not only one date, several such consistent dates have come. And the later, uh, the late dates, the latest that we have is 1830 BC. This is the Balathal. As far as Gilund is concerned, Gilund have not produced as early dates as Balathal. Uh, so according to the excavators of Gilund, uh, um, uh, uh, Professor uh, V.S. Shinde and the late Professor J.L. Pochel, they have again put uh, Gilund into three uh, uh, developmental phases. Uh, that is early Aharbanas, middle Aharbanas, late Aharbanas, and they have, they have given this date ranges like 1000 to 2500 or 2000 to 1700. And then from uh, Ahar, we know we have some second millennium BC dates. And we have also uh, late dates like 1500 BC. So taking all these dates into consideration, if we really want to talk about a regional perspective, then the beginning is somewhere around 3700 BC, that is early 4th millennium BC. And uh, the culture is, if we are seeing a decline or disintegration uh, by 1500. BC. So this is the kind of date range for the Ahar culture. Uh, of course, this culture uh, declined. We have a disintegration. So we this has been reflected in the late Chalcolithic phase, especially this has been studied at the site of uh, Virun. And a late phase, a similar kind of late phases has also been found from the site of Ojiana, the site of Mahami. Uh, Balathal uh, did not have a uh, late phase because uh, Balathal was abandoned by 1800 BC. Uh, but Gilun has a late phase. Ahar has a late phase also. So overall decline is, is uh, seen in the lifestyle, is reflected in you know, the structures and the pottery. Uh, the structures and the complexes of stones of mud bricks are now again replaced by either small circular or maybe rectangular structures and bottle and dwarf structures. And so some of the wares do not continue, the fine wares do not continue. And even if they continue, they're deteriorated in their quality. And of course, contact with the harpins have declined uh, but it remains uh, constant. I mean, uh, the contemporary chalcolithic cultures remains constant. And the reason why I'm saying is that outside, uh, see, decline or disintegration of a culture does not happen overnight. So it's a process. It's a cultural process that takes maybe 200, 300 years. So as I mentioned, the site of Balathal was abandoned by 1800. Uh, Ginun continued till 1500. Ahar continued till 1500. And Outside, interesting find is that outside the uh, Rajasthan domain, which is the core area of Me the Mewar, which is the core area of Ahar Banas, we have actually found Ahar culture in central area, at a site of Kayatha, where we have found a distinctive layer of Ahar. And then also in uh, Navgatoli, which is a site on the Narmada, we have found it in mixed with the, uh, uh, the local Chalcolithic culture. So, which means that, you know, basically the decline of this culture is kind of uh, uh, equated with the decline of the Harappan, as in how the Harappan culture started to decline. Ahar culture also started to decline, and probably the main uh, reason was environmental, because the area started to get dried up. The desiccation phase started from 2000 BC onwards, rainfall declined. And as I mentioned, that the mainstay of economy of this people were agriculture, and we know that Rajasthan is a semi-arid area. So probably the rivers were not perennial as long. And also the reason why uh, 
probably Balathal was abundant at the earliest because the close to Balathal, we do not find any rivers, but we have two large depressions which used to hold the rainwater. So the moment the rain uh, declined, probably the water, you know, uh, 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 availability of water also declined. And the reason why probably Ahar or uh, Gilun could sustain a little longer is because is that close to the rivers, Gilun is just 1.5 kilometer from the Banas, which was a perennial river in the beginning of the, at least in the beginning of the Chalcolithic phase. So because of the environmental deterioration, the culture declined and also because the trade contacts declined with the Harappans because the Harappans also declined. And so probably it could be that a section of people started to move towards the Malwa region, which was still comparatively, uh, uh, you know, fertile because it was it is fed by big rivers like Chambal and you know, Nandana and Petra and all that. So that is the reason why maybe we find like this in Kayatha, we find a distinctive um, uh, layer of uh, Ahar people. So there is a gap between the Kayatha and Ahar. And it, the way the Ahar has been found at the site of Kayatha, you do not see any development. It is like somebody has just come from outside and have settled down and just, just settled down and started. Uh, and in Navdatul, it is again, it, it has been found mixed with the culture and I mentioned I mentioned the site. Uh, there's uh, uh, ahar uh, material has also been found in association to Harappan sites and Harappan material, especially the site of Kanmer. I think Jivan sir is here. He could throw more light. Uh, I was there in Kanmer uh, for for a few days and I took uh, some training uh, as a student under him. So in Kanmer also in the mature phase they have found this white painted typical black and red where ahar pottery. So there is a lot of, uh, you know, evidence of this, you know, this is this interaction network, this fear that was going on. And of course, as in how the Harappans declined because of the uh, environmental deterioration, all other uh, Chalcolithic farming societies, which were also dependent on this environment, the rainwater, the rivers, uh, declined and trade as valid declined. And initially, slowly, slowly, it took some time, but slowly, slowly, this got disintegrated and you know, people maybe got distributed or dispersed into different different regions and got assimilated into other cultures. So uh, with that, I hope I have been able to give you uh, some idea about this culture. Again, as I mentioned, I am um, I do not have so many years of ex research experience and teaching experience. I'm comparatively young and one of the uh, one of the <laughs> young youngest teachers in Deccan College, and uh, I am. Uh, I, I, I said I do not consider myself a teacher, I consider myself a student. I myself have a lot more to understand, I myself have a lot more questions to look into. And uh, of course, I hope that in, um, in, in future uh, years, I'm hoping that we'll have some good research coming up and uh, we, we will try to still find answers to some of the elements of it. Yeah. regarding the development of this uh, indigenous Chalcolithic farming cultures and what kind of contributions it had uh, uh, in, in the development of the overall civilizational developments in South Asia. So with that, I uh, finish my talk. So these are the contributions of Ahar culture. So of course, first thing is early beginning of agriculture in the Mewar, absolutely independent indigenous development. We have nothing to do with the Harpins or Astasia. Then of course, we have this, uh, the site like Bagor, site like Gilund, uh, have given us some clue that there has been, there is the indigenous hunter-gatherer population have slowly transformed into the agricultural farmers. Then uh, uh, three phases of Chalcolithic development identified. We have new architectural evidences, uh, kind of evidences which we don't expect from rural Chalcolithic settlements. Then of course we have contact with contemporary Chalcolithic and urban communities. Uh, uh, then uh, cultural influence seen in their material equipment. And then, of course, interaction sphere, the Middle Asian interaction sphere that I talked about. And then, of course, declining, uh, decline coinciding with the Harappans, of course, climate and trade being the major factors. So with that, I end my talk. And uh, this is the, uh, again, another picture of my uh, institute, uh, college. And our tagline is Sang uh, Shrutena Gamimaki, which means let us be united with knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita Ji, for your...